coming to you from sunny Denver, Colorado. Get ready for your weekly dose of unscripted conversation all about the housing industry in the Centennial State. Although their specialty is in mortgages, in this show, they are transcending lending. And now, your host, the most unconventional guys in conventional lending, the Mortgage in Laws. Mark, thanks so much for being here today with us. Uh, we got Mark Walker here. Um, he is the owner of Lux Mana and recently wrote a guidebook, 10 Not So Obvious Ways to Boost Your Multifamily uh, NOI, Net Operating Income. So really excited to have him here. Thanks for coming, Mark. Hey, thanks so much. I'm happy to be here, guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, have you uh, you done other podcasts in the past? Yeah, I sure have. I've done I've done quite a few actually, which uh, which is good. So hopefully, I'll give you guys a good show today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so. why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your business and and what you do there? Sure. Well, you know, uh, Luxmana Investments. Um, I primarily specialize in residential and multifamily real estate. You know, for any of you guys that have read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad or played the affiliated game Cash Flow. Uh, my story is much like playing that game. I started out doing smaller residential deals and I just gradually worked my way up and now I do uh, larger apartment complexes so and, and I still strive to do bigger and bigger deals so yeah. uh, but I, I started out as a corporate employee. I worked for a company called Seagate Technology. Uh, we designed and manufactured and sold hard disk drives so. Cool. In computers and servers, consumer devices, a lot of those uh, things you might just have a Seagate hard disk in your computer right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I worked for them for almost 14 years and I was in senior management, uh, worked in the marketing and uh, sales area and loved my job, loved the people that I worked with, but I was investing in real estate in the side. And what motivated me to do that was this desire to be free. Yeah. Right. I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2003, and after that, my whole perspective was different. You know, this concept of achieving financial freedom, and I set my 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 sights on that. Uh, what's interesting is that I actually bought my very first rental property right here in Inglewood, Colorado. Mm. Uh, it was on Delaware Street. Oh wow, that's where yeah. I'm buying my You're house buying right in now. Delaware. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was a it was a duplex and. Owned that for a year or two. Self-managed at the time. Wanted to kind of get a general idea of what management was like. Uh, the primary lesson I learned from that was I never want to self-manage again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, then I sold that property uh, with the intent to 1031 exchange. But, you know, a number of things happened. The market was starting to really take off. I didn't know what I knew now. So... You know, I ended up uh, sitting out the next few years, which was probably a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Because we all know what happened mm -hmm. in the 2008, 2009 time frame. Yeah. Real quick, when you bought the du duplex, were you living in one side and renting out the other, or were you renting out both? No, I wasn't house hacking. Okay. Uh, I was renting out both, but, um, you know, yeah, actually, house hacking is a great strategy, though, you know, uh, for people that want to get into... Uh, you know, rental properties. Um, yep. If if that's a way you can do it, then I actually really encourage people to do that because, you know, you guys know as lenders, you know, you can get a traditional mortgage uh, for anything up to four units, and you can live in one side, and you can offset your mortgage by, you know, living or by renting out the other side. I think it's a great way to get started. Yeah, especially here in Denver, where rent is so high. Yes, you know, it's super easy to do that. It is. Yeah. And those those loans also, you can get an FHA or a VA loan actually on one of those types of properties of multi-units. So you can actually use a really small down payment. Also, another thing that a lot of people are doing, myself included, is buying houses that have not two units, but a separate mother-in-law suite or separate entrance to a basement or something like that. But helps us hack into the game a little bit quicker than having to save for as long of a period of time. So Absolutely. And you know, what you even just mentioned with, you know, finishing off the basements and stuff creating a side entrance and stuff there's actually three houses in my neighborhood up in longmont that have you know done that mm. and they're, they're getting pretty attractive rents as a matter of fact yeah so. do you know much about that process of if you're going to add an entrance to the basement like a to make it almost a walkout you know I, I i i've never done that uh but it's something that i'm definitely want to explore my wife is really interested in doing it uh, ever since these three houses in our neighborhood have, have done it. But what I've seen that these guys have done is, is they've literally dug down to the side of their house. They've mm -hmm. created a staircase, you know, going mm -hmm. down. Yep. Um, 
in some cases, you know, where people have a third car garage and you have a back door that actually connects up to that side of the house, that's even better because you can give them a car space as well. Yeah. And just dig down, give them an entrance, and, you know, if you finish it off, you can even soundproof. You know, soundproofing is, you know, really great. Uh, what you can do with that, you know, so uh, you can completely, you know, section it off from the rest of your house. It sounds like a yeah. pretty attractive strategy, you know, mm-hmm. that even me, someone who's established, you know, with rental properties and even larger commercial properties is, is, is even intrigued by the concept. Yeah. So. And if, if you're willing to, you know, live a little bit differently. So we rented out on Airbnb a separate unit for a little over a year. And it was an awesome experience. Most people, when I first tell them about that, you know, they first ask, oh, how's the money? And the money is really good. You can, on those short-term rentals, you can make a lot more than on a, a fixed long-term rent. But then they always say, well, did you ever have like really bad situations? Like what's the worst thing that happened? And we really, we actually met some of our best friends through that. We met a lot of cool people and had really great experiences too. So it's actually enriching as well. And that's one of the reasons why we're buying this other house is because it has a separate entrance to the basement. And we would like to get back into that. You know, it's, it's good money, but it's also a lot of fun and good experience. So Yeah. And you know, I think in general too, you know, we, we all just have found ourselves having a lot of space, you know, no matter how much space oh, yeah. you have, you're going to fill it. You know, what yep. are you going to fill it with? <laughs> Most of the time it's junk, right? Yep. Stuff you don't need. So if you can repurpose that space, give someone else, which in this environment right now, housing is such a shortage. Even rentals here in, in the Denver market right now are short. So if you can repurpose that space, give someone else a great place to live and make a little money on the side. Yeah. Well, nothing's wrong with that, right, guys? So, yeah. yeah. What Do you have uh, any insights or thoughts on the rental market and what you think it'll do? I think I heard that they increased... Uh, apartment housing by seven percent or something this last year, or yeah, I thought it was supposed to be like sixty thousand units were supposed to be going up in twenty seventeen, something like that. Yeah, you know, a lot is getting built, especially around apartments here in Denver. <clears throat> I'm not going to pretend to to know. You know, I wish I was smart enough to 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 know exactly what was going to happen. Uh, but I I actually am of the personal opinion that, you know, we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, rentals uh, continue to be, you know, uh, po- more popular, maybe even than, than, you know, home ownership, especially for the millennials. I look at a few trends that are going on, especially around the millennials right now. Um, first of all, a lot of millennials are coming out of college with records amount of college loan debt, more mm-hmm. than more than mm-hmm. ever, you know, and... Uh, on top of that, you know, they, they, they're, they're renting right now and their rents have been going up. At the same time, too, uh, the lenders are still a little tight. Mm-hmm. You know, they're requiring larger down payments than they have in the past. And so it's more difficult for millennials to save up for those down payments because of their higher rent and their mm-hmm. student loan obligations. I think, too, millennials are also getting married later in life, mm-hmm. you know, and they're not getting married um, and they're not having kids and moving out into the burbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, simultaneously, and I say this because I own a lot of condos and townhomes, uh, and, you know, we've had this thing in Denver around construction defects. Mm-hmm. You know, there's attorneys out there that have made a sport out of suing developers and builders for construction defects. And, you know, there's been some legislative changes that have happened in the last year here in Denver around that. But I don't think anyone's really, you know, anxious to be the guinea pig to test out those new laws and rules. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, as a result of that, you know, builders have not been willing to step out and build more condos and townhomes. Well, guess what? That's the affordable stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what first time home buyers typically go after. So their only option for new construction is, you know, a $300,000, $350,000 or more house yeah. out in the burbs, yeah. right? So, you know, some of these different trends and stuff like that just lead me to believe personally that we're going to continue to see rentals and apartment complexes and things like that, you know, be, uh, you know, grow um, into the foreseeable future. Yeah. So let's get back to, to your story specifically. So you had the first duplex, you sold out of it before 2007, eight sometime, sat out of the market. Uh, yeah. How'd you go from there? Well, it was around 2010 time frame that I started networking again and uh, getting the itch, as we say. I ended up meeting a general contractor and we partnered on a couple construction deals in uh, the Highlands, the West Highlands and the Berkeley areas here in mm. Denver. So at the time, those areas were really getting a lot of investment. They were very trendy. Mm-hmm. 
We bought um, a couple single family homes. We scraped them to the ground and we raised up a three story duplex on each lot. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Ended up uh, doing what's called a party well agreement where you basically separate the duplex and um, deed them each side separately and sold each side off. And uh, once the money started to come out from uh, the first of those two projects uh, in 2011, I started to focus again on building passive income, so buying rental properties. So at this point, were you working part-time as well or working full-time and doing this part-time? What, like, When did you actually start investing full-time? Yeah, great question. So yes, I was doing this part-time you know, while, while I was working full-time uh, for Seagate. And uh, I bought a lot of these rentals in Denver between 2011 and 2014. So that's when I was buying. I was buying in just the prime time yeah, here. Yeah, time. Very different market here in Colorado. It was really after 2014 that things really started to heat up here in yep. the Denver market. Uh, it was in January of 2015 that I left the rat race or left my corporate job. And uh, you know, at the you know at the time too, um, I knew that I wanted to continue to scale into my investments and do more with that. So um, I had built up enough passive income to leave the corporate job. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people, too, ask me, what, you know, what was your goal? What, how did you know it was time to leave the rat race? You know, I think it's a misconception, too, because truthfully, I was a very high-paid W-2 employee. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very fortunate in my career. Mm -hmm. But I actually left the rat race uh, before I uh, replaced that actual income. Uh, I actually... Um, decided early on how much money or excuse me what kind of lifestyle I wanted to live you know and then I started living it I started living it from that moment forward mm -hmm. by the way I want to say too I'm not cheap you know I'm not I'm not a cheapskate you know just to give you some examples last September um, took the family on a seven day you know five star vacation to Disney World we had a great time mm -hmm. October my wife went to Paris for 10 days Oh, I just nice. got back from Whistler. Um, I took a you know January trip to Whistler to ski for a few days. Wow. You know, so you know I live a good lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But um, what I what I decided is again I decided what kind of lifestyle I wanted to live, and then um, I was able to quantify how much that lifestyle costs. And I went off and I built passive income that was two x that. Mm -hmm. That's how I determined what my goal was for exiting the rat race. Wow. And so. Uh, you know, um, also, you know, in the time that I was building my portfolio in, in Denver, most of those were residential properties, but I dabbled a little bit in apartments. Uh, in late 2013, I bought a 12 unit apartment complex in Denver. And, uh, that was my very first apartment. Um, around, so, so, so now fast forward again to January of 2015, I left the corporate job, and a few months later, uh, someone came along and said, gave me an off-market offer for the 12 unit. And it was such a great offer. Literally, I was expecting to hold that property for 10 years. Mm -hmm. It was within spitting distance of where I expected to exit wow. on that property, uh, you know, another nine years later. Yeah. So this just goes to show you how hot the Colorado market's starting to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, decided could not uh, refuse that offer, ended up selling it and putting that into a 1031 exchange. Mm -hmm. And I ended up um, buying up into a 64-unit apartment complex uh, after that in December of 2015. But that was in Irving, Texas. Okay. So, uh, and that made more sense in terms of, you know, the, the cap rates and the returns, you know, that I was looking for. I was able to find that in Texas a little easier than, than it's been here in Colorado. So that's when I, I broke into the Texas market. Wow. How did you find that property originally? Were you just doing your research online? Did you get that from yeah. someone you knew? You know, um, it it was a listing that had been that had grown stale, essentially. Uh, the property was on the market for nine months. I think it was your classic example where the owner had this number in his head of what he thought the property was worth. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of offers that were less than that, mm -hmm. that he turned down. And after nine months, uh, you know, when his listing agreement had expired, I went in and, you know, made a deal with them and, uh, you know, ended up picking the property up.
for, for a decent price. So, and so you were licensed at the time? Well, I was licensed in Colorado. I'm still licensed in Colorado. Okay. Um, I'm a horrible broker because <laughs> I, I don't look for listings. I don't typically represent buyers. I'm typically you know just doing my own thing. That was, in fact, the first thing I did when I left my corporate job. I decided maybe it's time to get licensed, you know, because... It would complement what I do, mm-hmm. uh, and you know everything I'd done up to that point. I, had, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I was not licensed, but I just felt like it made sense. And so, so going back to that, I actually wanted to come back to January 2015 and hear yeah. what was that like. I mean, I'm sure there was an immense amount of excitement to be leaving that. Um, probably also some uncertainty, but. Do you remember back to that time well? Oh, I remember that very vividly. So, uh, in fact, that's a great question because uh, for anybody that aspires to, you know, leave your corporate job and, you know, build a portfolio of passive, you know, income and stuff like that, this is something you might want to start thinking about even now. Mm-hmm. Um, I had plenty of passive income, but for the prior 14 years working for a large company, my mind had been being trained that every two weeks, more money was just going to magically appear in my bank account. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even though I had plenty of passive income, uh, when I didn't, when that was no longer happening, that that consistent money every two weeks, that took probably six to 12 months to get used to. Yeah. That was just a change in mindsets. Um, I had a new normal Mm -hmm. that I had to get used to, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that was that was different. I wasn't expecting that, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, you know, you will get over it. You know, it, it's just it's just again, you're adjusting to a new normal. You're your own worst enemy because it was more of a mental battle. Just because I was I was trained to to expect that mm-hmm. every two weeks. So yeah. So you got a you're married, have a little girl. Yeah, yeah. How did your wife handle that? It, actually, my wife was so incredibly supportive. That's awesome. You know, hats off to her. You know, because she was so supportive you know, through all of this. And, you know, again, it's something we had talked about for a long time. You know, we knew that this was, that this time was coming. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a five-year-old daughter and, uh, you know, of course she, she, she didn't know any different, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah, my wife, my family, um, my, my daughter, they're, uh, they're everything. So, you know, and that's what it's all for. So, yeah, I'm sure you get a lot more time with them now as well too. yeah yeah that's true you know in fact um in terms of goal setting for 2017 my two goals are you know for myself um you know are, are, are essentially family and health mm-hmm. you know uh i'm to the point where i don't care if i make any more money i just don't want to make any less yeah. <laughs> you know? and so uh but but at the same time too um you know my goals are around uh you know having you know more authentic relationships and you know uh, having more time with my family and really spending more time with them and uh again secondly you know uh my my health um so you know just trying to eat right and uh you know get into the gym more often yeah so. and that's so exciting getting to simplify your goals down to to that base level that's something that I aspire to you know not to have these uh, just really detailed business goals and everything get to a point where you're you're doing enough to where you can really focus on those things that are yeah the, really the most important absolutely absolutely so oh sorry um, real quick so January 2015 you go full time full time investor so just as an aspiring investor what is what was like the biggest mistake or maybe near miss that you had when you first started doing this full time and also what advice would you give someone that's looking to do this or maybe a book to read. Sure. On investing. Sure. You know, absolutely. Um, well, so your first question was around, you know, uh, going at it full time. You know, uh, what advice do I have? Would you, would you mind if I answer that question a little bit differently and maybe absolutely. Just, uh, just broaden it to say, you know, real estate in general? Mm-hmm. Um, because back, uh, I'd mentioned that, you know, I took a few years off, you know, between, you know, selling that property that I'd acquired in 2004 and, you know, 2010. Um the market was heating up. It was it was very difficult to find deals that would pencil, mm-hmm. but at the same time, uh, you know, I I had ten thirty one exchange. You know, I put the the money that I gotten from the first deal into a ten thirty one exchange. I had full intent of investing that into another duplex. There was a uh, company in Denver uh, that um, was a developer 
that was uh, selling duplexes. They'd build an entire community of duplexes, and then they'd sell each duplex off to individual investors. They also had a property management division. They had a uh, division that um, was a 1031 exchange intermediary. They also had a division that specialized in non-owner occupied financing. Mm. You know, it was a great idea. Yeah. If the people were honest. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I ended up, um, you know, fortunately I did not invest more than I could afford to lose. But to make a long story short, I ended up testifying to the grand jury to help get the indictment wow. against the top guy that was involved and uh, I was the second guy they put on the stand at the official trial there was a very large number of people that were very badly affected by this Um, and he got a prison sentence over 130 years it was the largest fraud sentence for fraud ever given out in the state of Colorado wow so that was a little bit of a trip I think my biggest lesson, I call that my PhD in real estate, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Literally. Uh, And so, you know, I think the lesson learned, I know the lesson learned there was, you know, um, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I don't want to scare people, you know, because, you know, not, you know, most most people I believe are, are, are honest, you know. Uh, but, you know, I just, you know, anytime you're getting ready to, uh, you know, make a, a large investment, um, you know, always just, you know, check and verify, you know, who's who's involved and who you're working with and, and stuff like that. So Was there any financial reprieve that you received from that? Very little, very little. Um, when, when in a situation like that, um, you know, there, there's there's assets that the company, you know, has. The company went into receivership um, and they, you know, proceeded to sell off the assets of the company in order to make the investors whole and stuff like that. But it was a fraction of, you know, what, what had been put up and what had been lost. But, you know, um, what I can look back on that period, I mean, that was over 10 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, now I can look back and I can take the learnings and I can say, wow, you know, that has brought me to this point, you know, and, and it did, it did set me back in terms of confidence level for a while, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but you know, all, all is well that ends well. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so these days, what are you looking for in a deal? What what specifically are you looking to find? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm looking particularly for um, apartment complexes. Now, in the world of apartments, uh, we usually grade those apartments A, B, C, and very rarely you'll hear you hear of a D. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. <laughs> so an A class property is like a Ritz Carlton. You know, uh, brand new construction. You know, real trendy you know, latest and greatest finishes, things like that. A B class is a property that, you know, might have been, you know, might be, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years old, you know, uh, but it's been well maintained. Um, you know, I'd say that that's, you know, obviously your A class stuff are, is, is a very much a discretionary spend. The people that are living there obviously have, um, it's, it's a discretionary spend for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, B class is kind of your mainstream you know, um, you know, uh, working class people that live in B class, and then you know, C class. I would, um, you know, is is more your, uh, um, you know, working class people. You know, uh, that, you know, are, are that's your value class real estate. You know, uh, D class. I'd say is just you know, typically you know, a, a heavily dilapidated type property. You know, mm-hmm. uh, type you don't hear of D class very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also rank uh, the areas as well, from an A, B, or C class area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, typically your A class areas are going to be maybe they have br- it's surrounded by brand new construction, maybe new retail, and then you know offices and things like that, uh, and, and it just works down from there. So I typically look for C class properties in B class areas. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what I love about C-Class, I also call them a value-add value, value add deals or value-add opportunities. It's because I can come in and I can usually do um, a renovation mm-hmm. and you know address the deferred maintenance, maybe even add some amenities to the property. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example, t- today, um, you know, everyone wants to have, keep their dog. Mm-hmm. You, know, you have to be willing to rent to people with pets. Mm-hmm these days you know uh, maybe put in a dog park Mm -hmm. you know in the in the apartment you know community uh things like that you know um but also go in and renovate the units 
maybe replace the appliances, the flooring, you know, put fresh paint on the wall, replace the lighting fixtures, the plumbing fixtures, you know, things like that. What's nice about apartments is there's just not a whole lot that can go wrong inside those four walls, mm -hmm. right? So you can usually, uh, you know, uh, really put a nice, give, give a, a, a unit a nice facelift um, without uh, breaking the bank. And so, you know, I like to do those types of renovations, raise the rents, and if there's ways I can decrease the expenses as well, uh, maybe go in and put in LED light bulbs in the common areas. Um, you know, another thing that I've done that I really love is water conservation. Um, not only do I like to do that because it's good for the environment, but it's also good for your residents and yourself. You can actually lower the water bills significantly by going in and replacing all of the toilets with low flow toilets and low flow faucets and mm -hmm. you know shower heads and things like that okay so i reposition the property get the income up you know the net operating income up mm -hmm. and uh then either hold or you know do some kind of capital event to that type of property so usually what i'm targeting are uh, you know i'm targeting anything maybe 75 units or greater c-class properties and b-class areas um, I look for financially, I look for a property that ideally will produce a, you know, a nine or 10% cash on cash return in the first year uh, with a uh, 25, maybe a 20 to 25% IRR on a five year hold. So uh, why don't I break those down? Because for sure. some of the listeners may not know what a cash on cash return is mm -hmm. or um, an, an IRR. Mm -hmm. uh, so the best way to explain cash on cash return is that let's say you have hundred thousand dollars sitting in a savings account the bank is probably going to give you what Point, half a percent point interest five percent maybe yeah, yeah if, if, if it's if you're lucky yeah, right yeah you know um so you know every year on a hundred thousand dollars you might get five hundred dollars interest you know if, if you're getting a stellar savings mm -hmm. savings account rate mm -hmm. um so it's it's the same type of concept with cash on cash return uh, if you were to take that hundred thousand dollars out of the bank and invest it into real estate, if you were to get if, to get a ten percent cash and cash return on that, would be the same as instead of getting five hundred dollars interest um, in that first in that year, I would get ten thousand dollars interest. Mm -hmm. So that's cash on cash return. Um, IRR uh, stands for internal rate of return, and that takes into account your annualized return over the entire hold period. So if I hold that property for five years and I take all of the cash flow that I've gotten out off that property over that five years, and I also take any gain that I had when I sold the property mm -hmm. and I put it all together and then I annualize that return, then that's what your internal rate of return is. And I usually go for 20 to 25% IRR oh. on a property. That's awesome. Yeah. So. Is there some kind of database or something already existing that shows the class of the properties and also the area? Yeah, there absolutely is. Uh, for apartments, there's a great database out there called uh, Yardy, uh, Yardy Matrix. Uh, okay. It used to be called Pierce Island, but Yardy acquired Pierce okay. uh, maybe a year or two ago. And uh, what it is, is it's a database that basically has every apartment complex in a geographic area that's 50 units or greater. Uh, and it includes all sorts of great da data, uh, the class of the property, the class of the area. It includes the market rents for you know that that property in that area. It also includes the actual rents that that property is getting. They actually do rent surveys every maybe three or four months oh, wow. to determine that. Uh, it usually describes what the property amenities are, what the property last sold for, uh, what kind of debt it has on it. I mean, it's an amazing database. It even has some pictures. Okay. It's extremely expensive. Yeah, that was my you next know, question. I think that each uh, each major market like Denver, I'm just gonna go out. I'm just gonna guess here. Denver by itself, or you know, Denver, Colorado Springs is probably ten grand or more a year. Mm. You know, for that kind of data. Mm -hmm. um, but it does exist, and it's and it's great data. So so, so on. You said you. You're, you're going for something like 75 units or above. Mm -hmm. You have to build a resume to get to like to actually purchase something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that's to... a great question. In fact, that's another thing too that was really eye-opening for me when I made the transition from residential to multifamily investments. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say multifamily, I'm really referring to stuff that's five units or greater mm -hmm. when you're actually getting a commercial loan. Mm -hmm. 
right? And and you guys, you know, are the kings of you know residential loans, so you you can attest to this, right? Um, the way that those property, the way that those decisions are made, or those um, are underwritten, mm-hmm. is it largely comes down to the W two income um, of the individual, right? They look you you look to the individual to uh, service the debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to um, a commercial loan, the lender actually looks to the property to service the debt. Mm-hmm. So they're going to look to make sure that the property has enough rent and rental income and things like that in order to cover the debt service when they're making their decision. There are there are things that they are going to look at you for. Um, you know, again, with a residential property, they're looking to the individual to cover the debt service. I, I was never asked how much my income was, my monthly income was, when I went to get the uh, loan on the 64-unit property. Mm-hmm. Instead, they wanted to know three things. They wanted to know uh, what my experience was or what my track record was. Uh, and they typically like to see that you've owned properties before, similar properties preferably, and that you've demonstrated an ability to reposition those assets and successfully operate them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for me, you know, I had residential properties that I had successfully operated. Uh, I also had the twelve-unit apartment complex that I had successfully operated. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, when you uh, the the second thing that they look for is they look at net worth. So they want you typically. This is a general rule. There's some flexibility here depending on the lender. They typically want you to have a net worth greater than or equal to the loan amount. And so, um, you know, that's very important. And then the third thing is they want your post closed liquidity to be um, equal to about 12 months of mortgage payments, assuming that the property produces zero income in that okay. time frame. Uh, so, again, they're, they're looking for a guarantor that, you know, has the financial strength and the experience. To, uh, to, to take that project on and, and operate it successfully. Uh, but that not that interesting, though, that, that they never will ask you in that type of loan what your monthly income is? Yeah. They, do they check your credit report, at least? To... They do. They do do that as well. Okay. Yeah. What are the terms, the general terms, you get on, on one of those commercial loans? Well, um, it's going to vary. I'm going to put it into two different buckets for you, categories. One is um, uh, what we call bank debt, and the second is uh, agency debt. So a bank could be anywhere from you know J.P. Morgan Chase to uh, you know Wells Fargo or even a local bank mm-hmm. you know is willing to give you a commercial loan. Uh, there's also and and typically with bank debt it's going to be what's called a recourse loan. So if that deal would ever go sour and you couldn't service the debt, they're going to um, go look to the guarantors of the loan uh, to recoup their investment mm-hmm. with agency debt it's a little bit different you can typically get non-recourse options which means that if the property was ever to go sour and the project was to go bad they would um, they would um, they would never they would not come after you personally uh, for that now there's there's one exception they call them the typical bad boy carve outs um, that that's like fraud for example if you mm-hmm. commit fraud on a non-recourse loan guess what they're yeah. still going to come and get you but uh, but but that's the only exception is is, is the bad boy carve outs. Okay. Uh, it's 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 a non recourse loan or a non contingent liability, which is really attractive when you're doing your balance sheet. You can tell any other lender that that's a non contingent liability. Mm-hmm. So on the recourse, they don't want the property after you know if if something goes bad, they don't want the property. They just want to be held whole again, made whole again. Basically, they want you to sure buy out the rest of the loan. Yeah, they'd look to the guarantors to, you know, they, they would they would go after the guarantors, you know, okay. to, to recover, you know, their uh, their their investment as a bank, you know. Whereas with a non recourse loan, you know, they're not going to come after you personally. They will take the property. Mm-hmm. They would take the property, and they would look to liquidate it. Gotcha. You know, to to recover as much as they possibly could. And then what about interest rate and payback oh, yeah. term? You know, interest rates I'd say are you know pretty pretty similar to what you see with a bank. Um, you know, some some bank debt you might be able to get a little bit more of attractive interest rate. With commercial, what's nice is that banks will start to compete. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have as it's not as many regulations as place in place as say yep. some residential mm-hmm. you know type products. 
uh, you know, um, on a bank debt, um, most banks, they like to have no more than a 25-year AM. 30s is not unheard of, but it's I'd say on average it's usually going to be 25 years. Uh, with agency debt, um, if you're in a large market, um, you know, like say Dallas-Fort Worth or Denver, mm-hmm. you know, then uh, the banks, you know, not the banks, you know, the agency lenders will typically give you a 30-year AM. And again, they base that more on the location of the property. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's more of a secondary market, like say Windsor, Colorado, mm-hmm. you know, it's a little further out there, you know, they might go, um, you know, a, a you know twenty five year AM on something like that. Same thing with leverage. You know, um, in a large market, you know, the agency um, lenders will go up to eighty uh, percent loan to cost. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, a bank might uh, might do seventy five. Loan know. to cost. So we we do deal with loan to value. Is that right? Yeah. It's so so the difference is is loan to value is they take the purchase price of the property mm-hmm. and let's say it's they're going to lend you eighty percent leverage. Mm-hmm. Say it's a hundred thousand dollars to acquire that property. They're going to lend you eighty thousand dollars. Okay. With a loan to cost, the difference is is they're allowing you to take the acquisition price. Plus your uh, your renovation budget, uh, and they'll roll that into the loan. Oh wow! And that's a really attractive option, especially with uh, commercial real estate. You know, so like what I did with the sixty four unit is I acquired the property, and I also had a capex budget mm-hmm. that I provided the lender uh, for the first uh, year, the first twelve months that I was going to implement the first twelve months. And I went in and I completed that renovation. I spent um, about five thousand per unit. I was able um, I was able to roll into the loan. So about three hundred twenty thousand dollars in my rehab. Mm-hmm. I was able to roll into the loan. Wow! And that had a huge impact on the cash on cash return mm-hmm. um, and the returns of the property as well. So that was nice. So speaking of those renovations, I know in Denver. Um, contractors that you know they're they're busy it's hard to find good ones anytime or anywhere but right now there's just so much work to be done around here so i'm sure you have a list of contractors you work with here but when you go into a new market like irving or or somewhere else how do you go about finding the contractors you know i leaned heavily on the property management company in fact whenever i look at a new market one of the first things i do is start talking to the property managers and, uh, you know, in fact, I have a blog, you know, post that I made about this very subject about picking a property manager once, because if anything's true, there's, there's wimps and there's winners mm-hmm. when it comes to property management companies. And, uh, but once you find a good property management company that knows the area, they typically have a little black book mm-hmm. that you can leverage. They can introduce you to brokers, lenders, and contractors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's huge, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so so that's typically what I do is I, I lean on the property management company to help me out with that. Very cool. Yeah. So that's a component of you buying the property then, uh, is betting the actual property management company then. Yeah, you know I am totally a systems guy. Uh, I like to uh, build systems, everything from management to you know uh, insurance and everything, you know. So. Um, you know, I usually like to have systems in place um, wh- where I play. So I've got a fantastic property management company here in Denver that I really enjoy working with. Um, you know, I, I typically use the same insurance agent for everything mm-hmm. here in Denver and all of that, just because there's you know efficiencies that can be found and in 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 both of those things. You sure. know, and uh, you know everything from even my bookkeeping and stuff like that. You know, having just the one property management company, I have a system where it, you know, just takes all the transactions from the management company software and sucks it up into QuickBooks for me. Works really well, and so I just try to streamline wherever I can. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, we're working on systems a lot this year, trying to trying yeah, to get in that definitely. same spot. Realize when it gets yeah. real busy and you don't have the right systems in place, and <laughs> start yeah. bogging yourself down. Exactly, and that's really important for scale. You know, mm-hmm. if you desire to scale, then you need to be thinking about, like you are, you mm-hmm. know, you need to be thinking about those things early on, mm-hmm. you know, so you're ready when you do have that scale. So I saw you're um, not only the owner of Lux Mana, but also involved with Peak Margin Partners. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the difference in those two companies and what you do? Yeah, Lux Mana is 100% owned by me, Peak Margin Partners. Um, I own 50% of and I have one other partner. 
Okay. So we're 50-50 partners. How'd you, yeah. how'd you meet that person? That's actually my property manager. Oh, oh no kidding. And so, yeah, we own, we own two properties together in Peak Margin Partners. So it's a rather small portfolio. Okay. Um, but, yeah, we, uh, but uh, Peak Margin is, um, you know, a partnership, and I'm the managing member of that as well. Gotcha. Very nice. So, yeah. Do you ever, I think I saw it on your website, I could be wrong, do you ever do tax lien purchases? You know, I have. Okay. Um, I've done them in Illinois. And I have actually, uh, you know, gotten the deed to properties um, from a tax lien. Um, now, I'll just be honest. I, for anybody that's listening, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it was an interesting experiment. I started doing it, and I think it was 2010, 2011. I'm trying to remember which year it was. It might have been 2011 that I started doing it. And, uh, you know, whenever, when, when doing tax liens, I and mean, this is my humble opinion, um, first of all, it's very different. It's different in every single state, maybe even every single county. Like, for example, here in Colorado, it's different in every county. Mm-hmm. You know, um, in fact, if you want to do it here in Colorado, you might look somewhere along the, like Garfield County on the western slope, you know, stuff like that. Because um, from my understanding, at least a couple of years ago, that was a, they, they paid the, the best penalty. You got the best penalty rate, you know, in, in those um, areas. But the reason I chose Illinois is because you're able to get um, up to a 36% penalty rate when you acquired the lien. So basically, you went in, you paid someone's delinquent taxes for them. And then um, in Illinois, if they paid you uh, from uh, day zero to day 180, they owed you half of that annual penalty. Uh, oh, and I should probably back up here and say it. The way, the way it works in Illinois, it's, not, it's, it's, different, it's different there. Um, literally, when you go and you bid on these tax liens, they literally start at the max penalty of 36%. So you're actually bidding for your bidding on penalty. So someone says, I'll take that one for 36% penalty. Mm. The next guy will raise his hand and say, I'll take that one for 35% penalty. The next guy raises his hand and say, I'll take that one for 24% penalty. Uh-huh. Right? And obviously, the nicer the property, the penalty is probably going to go down. Then that person, that you, you pay their taxes for them you now are in that lean position. You're in the number one lean position, even above the bank. And um, that person now has to pay you back plus the penalty. Mm. And so uh, whatever the penalty is, if they pay you the very next day, they're on the hook for half of the penalty. So say it's 36% annualized penalty. If they pay you between day um, zero and day 180, they owe you the, the taxes plus 18% penalty. If they pay you in day 180 to day, you know, 360 mm-hmm. or whatever, they owe you um, the, the the taxes plus 36 percent. If it goes into the next year, it's it, if it's if it's say the end of the next year, say it's day 698, right? They're going to owe you a 72 percent penalty oh, wow. on top of the paying you back for the taxes. Now this can go on for th- a maximum of three years. And after that, you can basically, um, you know, file for eviction, and that that's probably about a year long process. And if they don't come long in, process. yeah, if they don't pay you off and stuff like that, then you can take the property now. In this case, when you actually take the deed, you're responsible for all the back taxes too. <clears throat> you have to pay all the back taxes in order to get the deed. What I found is that I was happy to take the penalty from people. You know, when they would pay me back and pay me back the penalty, that worked great. I actually did not enjoy foreclosing because um, taxes in certain counties of Illinois are ridiculously high. Mm. Ridiculous. You're paying two, three years of it. Yeah. And uh, in some cases, too, in like rural areas and stuff like that, you know, it's um, it, it was even um, more than the actual what I had valued the property at. And so there are some that I just, you know, continue to cloud the title on mm-hmm. and, and, and have never taken, you know, the deed. But, um, you know, there, there, there are, there, there's, there's some that I have taken, you know, the deed on. And, uh, again, they're just, they're not, I would rather have just been paid back the penalty, mm-hmm. you know, and called it done, mm-hmm. you know. So I won't be doing any more of that. But again, you know, it's, it, it was it was a fun experiment. Um, you know, I made a little bit of money. I didn't lose any money, but mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, and, and like I said, I still you know have uh, you know have some you know liens and stuff like that there that you know who knows what could happen with in the future. Mm-hmm. So does that penalty ever cap out? 
Like, yeah. at what point does it cap out? Three say. years is basically Three years, max. okay. Yeah, and then after that, you're faced with the decision, you know. Um, and, and so I just, I, most of them I just continue to, cl- to cloud the title, what we call cloud the title. You know, so if, if anyone ever wanted to try and buy that property or, you know, take take out my position or something like that, they'd have to pay pay back my back ta- my tax plus my the, taxes plus plus the three years of penalty wow. gotcha. so so you've invested here in Colorado in Texas and Illinois I think there was at least one more state that you're... yeah I've owned in I've owned in Florida as well okay you know but I'm not active there so not active um, in Florida not really active in yeah, Illinois anymore. Anyway, it's mostly Colorado and Texas right now okay and going forward um, you know I would love to find something here in Colorado um, you know, or Texas. Um, so, you know, that's, those are my, you know, target areas. And again, it's where I have the strongest systems. Mm-hmm. So have a great property management company in both places. So, you know, um, but it is a little harder to find the deals right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, what's great is I don't feel like I'm desperate for a deal, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's important for any investor mm-hmm. is know your acquisition criteria and stick to it. There's going to be times like now when it's a little harder to find the deals, mm-hmm. you know, just stay diligent. Um, if you know how to find the deals, you know, they're out there to be found. You just need to invest the time and, you know, get out there and network and stuff like that. And, you know, you'll find them. And, and you know, every single investor has their own secret sauce, right? You know, uh, I know that I can take a property of a certain type and I know that I can apply, you know, my, uh, my, my unique value add to that property. And I can usually get a pretty predictable outcome, mm-hmm. you know. So once you've invested for a while and you've found your niche and stuff like that, you know, um, I think that's where everyone should strive to be for. Just know your niche, make make whatever you do repeatable, mm-hmm. and just keep doing it over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So. so I saw that you went to school at Oral Roberts in mm-hmm. Tulsa. So yeah. where are you from, actually? Are you from Oklahoma? I'm originally from Minnesota. Okay. Uh, yeah, I grew up there. I grew up in a little town. Uh, I think the population was maybe 2,200 people. Oh, you wow. know, Real yeah. little town. it was a little town. Um, in fact, I took my wife there maybe five years ago and we went and we ate in one of the original restaurants and she was kind of looking around like you grew up here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know but it, but it was, it was a great place to grow up. And then, yeah, I went to uh, college at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, really enjoyed my time there. Um, ended up graduating in December of 99. I ended up going back to Minnesota um, you know, I uh, spent about a year up there before I moved to Colorado. But, you know, the day that I moved to Colorado, it felt like home. You know, yeah. we are so fortunate to live here in Colorado. I mean, it's great. We are. And, yeah. yeah. I, I actually, my background, I moved around my whole life. My dad works for an oil company. So mm-hmm. I've lived in 18 different places. And wow. uh, one of the last places I lived before coming out here permanently was in Arizona in Phoenix area and I actually liked it a lot but I knew after just a couple months this isn't home you know like and so it was like very it was kind of scary for me you know I had finally become an adult graduated college my job was out there and I was like I like this place and it only took a couple months to realize it wasn't home so I bounced back to Oklahoma where I owned a house I'd gone to school at the University of Oklahoma nice. and then finally decided without having a job here that I just have to come to Colorado and it's such that home feeling and it's so crazy to me because I lived in Oklahoma on and off for about six years and I have very few friendships you know people that I still can't stay in contact with or even friends that I had while I was there it just it wasn't me and then I moved here and it was just like a magnet immediately I just started meeting people who were friendly and that's one of the great things about this place is there aren't a lot of natives, and I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. Um, people are coming here from Minnesota, North Dakota, places that are a lot colder, a lot flatter, yeah. uh, or a lot hotter as well in the summertime, and enjoying this place. They want to meet new people. You know, they're not natives. They want to do all the activities. So it's right. an incredible place. It is, you know, and, you know, every single day I look at those mountains and I'm just uh, in awe all the time, you know, but you're right. We have four full seasons. Yeah. You know, the snow actually melts here. That was one thing about Minnesota. You know, the one thing I probably miss most about Minnesota is the water. You know, they call Mm, it the land of 10,000 lakes. Mm -hmm. There's actually over 13,000 lakes in Minnesota, but uh, so I do miss that. I, I, I always enjoyed the freshwater fishing and ice fishing and water skiing and things like that, Mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, but again, Man, I see those mountains every day, and I'm just in awe. Yeah. So, so um, going back to Oklahoma real quick. Yeah. So I 
I know there's investment potential out there right now. It seems like you might not have relationships, but do you ever look at those kind of markets where, you know, they're really heavy on oil and energy and it's been a rough patch. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity right now in real estate. Do you ever look outside to other states and maybe think that the juice will be so worth the squeeze that it's worth getting into a new market and finding a new property manager? I do think about that. In fact, um, if I was to do it, I would probably add maybe one more ge- geography, and then after that, I'd probably have to clone myself. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but um, yeah, and I do like Oklahoma. Um, I, it sounds like Oklahoma, and I don't. I'm by by no means you know take this very lightly. I'm no, I have not researched it extensively, but it does sound like there's maybe some interesting opportunities in Oklahoma City area. Mm-hmm. Um, Tulsa <laughs> is a great town. Obviously, I went to school there. One thing about Tulsa is it's a very just steady market. It, it's it's not a rapid growth market. Never has been. Uh, now at the same time, when there was the downturn, they weren't as affected as other geographies, mm-hmm. you know, in the U.S. But you know, it's always just kind of been one of those slow and steady markets. So you know, for the the right type of investor, maybe someone that's just interested in you know buying maybe a long term hold. That's that's an interesting market. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I I'm definitely in that mode right now where it's it's tough to find deals, mm-hmm. um, especially in Denver, mm-hmm. and uh, you know Dallas Fort Worth area has has followed. Mm-hmm. You know, great job growth in Dallas Fort Worth and stuff like that. But what that essentially means is that even a lot of the institutional uh, type investors, you know, REITs, you know, real mm-hmm. estate investment trusts and stuff have, you know, moved into the area and they've got a lot of capital to play. So it's very competitive. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I, I am looking at possible, you know, other markets um, and stuff like that as well. What about here locally? Do you do any uh, single family home purchases anymore? Or are you strictly multifamily? I'm, I'm mainly focused on multifamily now, you know, like any investor, cause I'm a yield hog. You know, um, mm-hmm. if I ran across a, a single family deal that was just amazing that I couldn't pass up, absolutely I'd do it. Yeah. You know, but I'm proactively looking for multifamily investments. Okay. What are the areas that are, constitute B areas for apartments here in the Denver metro? Oh, boy, there's a lot of great areas. You know, I'd really say that um, the, the B areas, um, obviously, I'm going to generalize um, the answer here and just say that, you know, typical B class area is usually near retail. You know, it's, it's got like a Target or a Walmart, mm-hmm. you know, very close by, you know, lots of amenities in the area, parks and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we see that all over Denver. One thing that's great about Denver right now is it's getting a ton of investment. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, you know, the second criteria that I apply to, to the property grade is really the vintage. You know, I'd say anything from like a 1980 vintage or better, mm-hmm. you know, is is, is, is most likely um, a, a solid B or has the potential to be a solid B, you know, with some renovation, mm-hmm. you know. But, you know, what, we're just very fortunate, you know, here in Denver where there, it's getting a ton of investment. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of, you know, institutional investors that are coming out and raising up some amazing, very modern buildings. In fact, I've even seen some new construction down in Texas, and I'd say that it is nothing, you know, compared to the really cool contemporary, you know, uh, state-of-the-art construction we're seeing here in Colorado, in Denver, Colorado right now. Yep. Yeah. So you you go on all of your investments. It sounds like pretty much yourself. You have the one partner, uh, otherwise, but you're not really looking for other people to invest or anything. You're... Well, actually, I do have two partners on the 64 unit apartment complex. Um, you know, I own, you know, a good good sized chunk of that. I'm the you know I'm the sponsor. I'm the asset manager um, or the managing member of that mm-hmm. deal. Um, you know, my my as I said early on, my goal is to continue to do bigger and bigger deals. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I had a mentor that said to me uh, a long time ago, the bigger the deal, the easier it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that never really resonated with me until I owned the 64-unit apartment. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that I really spend about the same amount of time renovating the 64-unit as I would the 12-unit, you know, or a 150-unit deal. Yeah. You know, the, the only difference is, is that the bigger the property the uh, bigger the budgets you have to play with mm-hmm. and the potential pot of gold at the end of the rainbow mm-hmm. is a lot nicer too. Yeah. So my my goal is to continue to scale up and do larger and larger deals. And, you know, in order to do that, you know, my, my available capital is no longer enough. So yes, I am, um, you know, I, ha- I do, you know, keep a, a list of people that have expressed interest in, 
you know, uh, you know, coming in as a, you know, a passive um, equity investor, you know, and, you know, if I uh, run across the right deal that meets my acquisition criteria and, you know, my, uh, my unique value add and, then, then, then absolutely, I'll be reaching back out to those people that have expressed an interest, and you know, I definitely, you know, look to look to do bigger and bigger deals going forward. Gotcha. Yeah. So you mentioned that you had you had learned that lesson from a mentor. Uh, we're actively Dylan's looking for a mentor right now. Big time. Um, and we know the benefit of of having one. So how did you go about finding this mentor or them being in your life? What was their role? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the best things, you know, uh, to look for in a mentor is, you know, find someone that, you know, you've crossed path with, crossed paths with, mm-hmm. you know, that you, uh, you know, going back to, to that lesson that I learned about, you know, trust, but verify, you know, someone that you, you, you know, is the real thing, mm-hmm. um, and is, uh, worthy of mentoring you, mm-hmm. you know, um, but, uh, you know, it might very well be someone that's already in your life, um, or, you know, it, it might even just be, you know, someone that owns the property down the street, you know, that, that you've, you know, seen and, you know, followed and, 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 and you, you know, want to, you know, achieve similar results. You know, there's lots of different ways to make money in real estate. That's the beautiful thing about it. So, you know, I just, you know, decide what you want to do and then, you know, look for someone that you can look up to that, that's, that's done it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, uh you know, and if there's something that you can offer that mentor as well in exchange, whether it be your, your time or something that is going to make it worth their while, I'd mm-hmm. say that's that's a huge thing too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just to make it a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, now me, um, you know, the person I'd say is closest to my mentor right now is my cousin. He's a 30-year veteran in multifamily. And uh, it's funny because uh, when... When I was, you know, investing in single family stuff between, you know, up until 2014, <clears throat> there was a point where, you know, we used to get together and have lunch like every six months. And I'd talk about what I was doing with residential. He'd talk about what he's doing with multifamily. And, uh, you know, um, when I uh, when I decided, you know, when I had reached my goal and stuff like that, he gave me the opportunity um, to come and sit in his office and job shadow him um, to learn how the really big stuff goes down. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really made the transition into larger multifamily properties. And that was huge. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that was a huge opportunity to go and and watch him and sit in his office, you know, uh, have access to his network and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, in that case, my mentor was right under my nose. Yeah. You know, uh, so that's why I say it might already be someone and it's in your life, Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, again, I would just, you know, decide where you want to go and then find a person that, you know, has, uh, has already, you know, achieved that or, you know, uh, and and maybe approach them. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Well, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, I did want to mention again, uh, Mark has been kind enough to give the listeners of our podcast a free copy of the new guide that you wrote, um, 10 Not So Obvious Ways to Boost Your Multifamily NOI. You can find that at his website, www.luxmana, which is L-U-X-M-A-N-A.com slash Transcending Lending. Anything you want to say about that uh, guidebook? Yeah, you know, I'll just say that, you know, we, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, right? You know, um, when I acquire a multifamily property, um, my goal, my uh, objectives are pretty clear. I try to increase income and decrease expenses. And the reason for that is because commercial properties, their value uh, is very uh, just directly related to the income of the property, the net operating income. So what I talk about in this guide are some of the not so obvious ways that I've discovered um, on my journey of ways to increase income and decrease expenses. So very neat. So as we're wrapping this up, is there anything you'd like to add about yourself, hobbies, some stuff you guys like to do, you and your family like to do on the weekend, or I know you mentioned you have a blog, so mm-hmm. the website on that is, what's that? Yeah, yeah, again, that's on luxmana.com okay. as well, you know, um, I probably don't blog as, as often as I'd like to, um, but uh, but yeah, I do have, you know, several blog posts that m- might be of assistance to, you know, other investors that, that aspire to, to do this and maybe even escape the rat race. As far as on the weekends and fun stuff with the family, right now we're skiing a lot. Nice. 
Um, you know, you'll usually find me either at Copper, Winter, or Eldora, typically. Good man. Um, yeah, absolutely. You <laughs> I'm know. a super pass holder as well. Long time. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool, cool. So I have to get out there. Usually we're over on the, the Mary Jane side of Winter Park about 90% cool. of the time. So. Are you a skier or a snowboarder? I snowboard. Okay. Like, we're out where the skiers are most of the time. We're out we're out in the trees and, and the bumps. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. How's the little girl doing? Yeah. She's doing pretty good, actually. We have her in lessons at Eldora. Um, it's her second year of lessons, and uh, this year has really been a, a good takeoff year for her. She's she's learned to turn mm-hmm. a little bit better and control her speed. You know, so she's doing greens with us. So, you know, I think she's at a point where you know now that she can control her speed and stuff, she can really go as fast as she wants, and she'll she'll continue to progress from there. But it's fun. You know, and there's she's nothing really better. Enjoying. I got a I got a two year old little girl, and then That's one awesome. due in three weeks. So I have two awesome. little girls. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations! I yeah. love the girls, man. They just they melt your heart. You know. Oh, dude, I cannot explain the experience with having a girl. It's it's mind blowing. Like you said, like the second she, you know, came out, like she just snatched my heart, and I was done. She had me That's wrapped. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I should probably give an update on that too because the last podcast we recorded, you weren't here because mm-hmm. I had said that your wife went to labor, which I guess she did, but she did not have the baby. Yeah, so. she actually went into labor for 15 hours, and Ooh. they were about to induce her, and then she that morning she went out of labor. Wow. So we've actually been back to the hospital twice now. Um, she went into labor last night actually for another eight hours, oh, and wow. we were there until like 2:30. They discharged us so we're just waiting i think that baby's coming this week but she's doing awesome. three well yeah. congratulations yeah, i appreciate it yeah so thanks so much for coming i know you can find mark on linkedin and also on bigger pockets it's mark walker so you can look him up there he is out of longmont for now we'll let you get going back because you got a long drive back up north and yeah maybe can miss the the rush hour traffic so thanks so much yeah. for coming appreciate on. Your time, mark. thank you again guys really appreciated this and, and had a lot of fun yeah we did too All right, we'll do it again. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Transcending Lending. For more episodes, subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app or visit our website at transcendinglending.com. Tune in next week for another great episode.